All right. Okay. Well, hello everyone. I'm Chris Fargo. I'm the president of NAPCA. Um, NAPCA is here on campus. Uh, we um, basically teach students, staff, and faculty about, um, you know, Native American history, but also about what's going on presently, which is um, one of the big issues that isn't being educated within schools um, is that, you know, Native Americans are still around and they're very present. So, all right. Great. So, that's a um, Native American Cultural Awareness Association, and we're glad to have you. I'm going to, I'm Holly Denning, I'm the, one of the co advisors. And I'm going to read the um, land acknowledgement statement before we get into our presentation today. So, as we gather here today to hear the presentation about Black Hawk guide, uh, War Guide, what, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, we remember that we exist today on traditional lands of many Native people. We welcome the duty and opportunity to share stewardship of these lands and this place in the 21st century. While this state has a rich history for thousands of years, the region and these lands were home to diverse native peoples. The Ho-Chunk grew corn and gathered a living from these lands. The Potawatomi, then closely related to the Ojibwe and Ottawa peoples, called this land home as well. We welcome and are honored by the responsibility to be good stewards of these lands and good neighbors to all Wisconsin indigenous populations. In concert with Native American Cultural Awareness Association, Native students, faculty, and staff, the university continues to explore durable and meaningful ways of acknowledging our relationship. And I would add that for today's talk, we're going to be thinking about the Meskwaki, Fox, and Sauk chased through these lands just to the west along the Rock River. And the Mis so I'm really glad today to welcome Ben and um, Strand. And I want to um, ask people to mute if you are um, if you are not muted at the moment. And I'm going to mute myself too. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Ben, for being with us today. Sure, great, Holly, and everyone. Thanks for uh, spending a couple minutes. Um, I'm excited to let you all know a little bit more about the Black Hawk War Guide, um, uh, work that attempts to document and track down all the current um, battlefield sites, roadside plaques, museums, um, historic areas that were affected during the War of 1832, and also a lot of the commemorations and a lot of the areas that since then people have tried to um, document and understand and share that story, that it's interesting how that has changed over time, and you can see it from the different sculptures and murals and artworks uh, across the, the area. Um, I want to, at the very first, um, uh, thank the SAC and Meskwaki nations who are still uh, thriving and vibrant communities in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Iowa. I'm going to uh, I wanted to uh, give you kind of a broad overview. Um, the three large triangles are the homes of the, the Sac and Meskwaki nations. Um, you'll notice that the largest community is in Oklahoma, just about an hour from Oklahoma City, is probably the largest um, community. And um, they're the ones who I worked with um, the most on this project. And I was very lucky that um, one of their members, uh, Keelan Hamilton Youngbird, wrote the wonderful forward for the work. A uh, really dynamic young individual that um, I really encourage you that um, both at Arcadia Press and on Amazon, if you look up uh, the book, there's a few sample pages that you can peruse for free and his forward is really the most important part of the the work i think so i encourage you to, to check that out and then for us here in in wisconsin uh the meskwaki in iowa are the closest geographically that i'd also encourage folks to to check out they um have been having a community powwow since 1908 that is open to the community 
It's usually uh, in the early part of August. They're doing a lot of great work where they've brought back some bison to the landscape and um, are doing a lot with a heritage uh, um, crop growing, especially corn. Uh, real, another really just thriving, wonderful community that again has their own museum and cultural center and is uh, they welcome you know public to come come and join them. Uh, and the interesting uh, facet of the Meskwaki in Iowa is they're one of the the only um, Native American communities, I think, that actually purchased their own land. Um, after the war of uh, 1832, the Black Hawk War, um, they did not give up their uh, you know, love for the land. And even though it was the far Western um, territory that they, they um, had claimed to before the Black Hawk War, they kept returning. And luckily, um, the governor of Iowa allowed them to eventually purchase the land. And since then, they've uh, kept growing and thriving, and it's a great community. The other little notations on the map, um, I won't go into at length, but you can see the, the, the whole scope of the museums and, and area that was affected during the Black Hawk War that are more detailed one by one in the book with uh, GIS coordinates to help you find each one of them. I also want to note um, for people's further reading, and I put this at the start because I think it's so important, uh, are, are these three resources I highly recommend. The very first is, of course, Black Hawk's own autobiography. It is It was written just a couple of years after the Black Hawk War. It is now in the public domain, um, so you can go to uh, Google Books or Hathi Trust, or I think uh, University of Illinois also has it digitized online. And it's really a wonderful first person narrative, not only of the cultural traditions of, of Black Hawk and his family, but also the, the personal reasons why, um, from his point of view, um, the, the conflict happened and also the aftermath where um, after um, the, the, the battle, uh, the, crash, the massacre at Bad Axe, um, his imprisonment and eventual tour of uh, Eastern cities. The, the next book is, is also um, freely available online. It's uh, written by a woman author who um, detailed the pioneer Northwest Territory, present day um, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois. Uh, by Julia Kinsey. Um, people from Chicago might recognize her name. Um, after 1832, Juliet and John left uh, their home uh, in Portage, Wisconsin, and moved to Chicago, where they, they became quite a name in, uh, as uh, land developers in, in the city. But her remembrances of, of the area, especially around the Lake Geneva area, uh, documenting uh, Potawatomi villages, um, de uh, describing uh, Bigfoot's village next to uh, in current day Beloit is, is really wonderful. She's just a, a striking author and really brings the landscape to the forefront. The other is the Cherokee Phoenix, which was uh, from around 1826 to 31, was actually um, uh, an endeavor that brought in the voices of members of the Cherokee Nation. So a very unique perspective on the, the times of the, of the day. Here's a, here's a quick snapshot that uh, during uh, the Black Hawk War, there are two papers in Galena, Illinois, which really have amazing information, but it also shows the limit of what information is freely accessible both the Miner's Journal and uh, Galenian, uh, which you can see here uh, are the microfiche samples, which if you uh, can read this text for more than an hour or two at the time, you're doing better than, than I was able to. It really gives you a, a headache after a while, but it shows how much information is still uh, in need of being digitized. 
And while we have wonderful research libraries across the country, there's still a lot of hidden resources and personal archives from people during this time that I think will hopefully eventually be more accessible and can, can add more to the story. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin and my whole journey in, in digging into the Black Hawk War started when I came across this sign outside of Cold Spring, Wisconsin, just a few miles north of Whitewater at an old pub, the, the Cold Spring Inn. And I, I was really struck. I didn't know much about the Black Hawk War. I didn't certainly didn't know that Abraham Lincoln was a militiaman in the conflict. Um, so that that little sign <laughs> uh, kind of led me down the, uh, the rabbit hole, as it were. And slowly over time, I read more and more about the Black Hawk War and the conflict and was finding that a lot of uh, the local museums didn't have as much of the personal story or, or the impact that the war had on our Native American uh, nations. And I just dis kept discovering it. And, and as I went and visited each of the Native American nations, I wanted to um, slowly um, see what I could to get the story more accessible. And, and early on, you know, Black Hawk's name is really ubiquitous. Um, it was striking that in only 30 years after the end of the conflict in 1862, the USS Navy christened a ship, the USS Black Hawk. So here, within the lifetime of some people who are trying to kill Black Hawk and drive the Sac and Meskwaki out of their native lands, we were honoring Black Hawk and his community. Um, and it was one of a series of Navy vessels. The, the black and white photo is a pie eating contest of, uh, of uh, World War I uh, service members serving on the, the Black Hawk in, uh, around the Atlantic uh, Ocean. Um, and then, of course, his name, Black Hawk's name, has been used to sell many products. Um, he's, I think, the only person who has not only a a professional hockey team, the Blackhawks, named after him, but the original Atlanta Hawks, when they started in the Quad Cities, they too started out as the Blackhawks. So as I kept, you know, digging more and more into it, I found how important the the national tenor was in telling the Black Hawk War story, and also the the local Midwestern story. And um, in 1830, Andrew Jackson and a slim majority of our Senate and U.S. House of Representatives passed the uh, Indian Removal Act. And there, there are many, you know, it was it was a big fight. There are a lot of great quotes and and from the floor of the debates. And one of the most striking I found was a group of women from Steubenville, Ohio, who, of course, being women couldn't vote then, but they, you know, noted that this was going to really hurt America's character. Um, but it, it still passed and it was the law of the land and it really gave the US military the go ahead to forcibly remove uh, so many of our Native American tribes from throughout North America. I, uh, I personally was born in the small town of Dodgeville, Wisconsin, in southwest Wisconsin. And the town literally was named after Henry Dodge, um, who was one of the more fo forceful proponents during the conflict. Um, Henry Dodge was a Kentuckian who came up to Wisconsin and settled a lead foundry just north of Galena, Illinois. And while land was being platted and sold legally in Illinois, Wisconsin and Iowa were still a territory and it was technically illegal to um, set up uh, a business as it were a mining operation, but that didn't deter Dodge. He had over a hundred armed men working a mine by 1828. 
and he also brought slaves with him. He had six slaves in his household, uh, and again, not uh, not a slave. Illinois was never a slave state. Wisconsin never was, but um, he did have um, people working for him who were he had brought up from Kentucky. The other interesting and and disturbing point in that. Um, he wasn't the only one. There are a handful of other early mining operations who owned slaves in Wisconsin. But there were military commanders, such as Zachary Taylor, who was the commander of Fort Crawford and Prairie du Chien, who had two servants who were also um, um, helping with agriculture, his farm in, in Prairie du Chien, um, which, which was really surprised me. Um, there were a couple other um, Union officers who had slaves at Fort Ca Crawford, including Jefferson Davis, who, of course, would go on to become the president of the Confederacy. Um, so it was it was very interesting to to see that um, nationally uh, the tenor was to you know drive out Native American communities. And that locally, um, the Boone and the Lead region, and which resolved with revolved a little bit about around slavery, um, was was just kind of a, a pretty big surprise to me. I just want to take a breath. Are people uh, able to to hear me all right? Any short questions at this time? Okay. Sound, sound is good, so for me. Oh, good, good. For me, it also sounds good, so. Perfect. Well, then, um, the the largest settlement of the Sac and Meskwaki was at Sakinuk, a town of sometimes estimated over six to 8,000 people in today's Rock Island, Illinois, and a pretty spurless treaty from 1804 had... Um, convinced six of their members who were not allowed to sign a treaty who had gone down to St. Louis um, to try to um, get the release of one of their uh, members who was in, in prison in St. Louis, that they had been forced to sign away um, pretty much all of their territory east of the Mississippi River for about $2,200 and $1,000 a year. Now, at that time, in 1804, the, the, the community was selling to uh, the, the Indian agent who, who that was assigned to them at Rock Island around $20,000 to $24,000 in pelts and corn and, and other vegetables a year. So it would you know, seem very unlikely that they would you know, want to really give up that sort of a community. And, you know, it was uh, by any stretch of the imagination, just not really a, a fairly, you know, based treaty whatsoever. And they fought for it for decades. But in 1818, Illinois became a state and more and more Americans started to immigrate to the area. So the, the Sac and Fox were forced to go west and the gentleman on the on the horse, Keokuk, was the traditional one of the one of the traditional chiefs, and did acquiesce and took um, the communities um, west of the Mississippi. And then his wife is is the other um, portrait uh, shown. However, um, Black Hawk and other members of the community did not want to leave, and they wanted to um, contest their right to the their their land. And and farm fields in Sakinuk. So um, Waboshik, the prophet on the right in the the white uh, outfit in Iowa, on the left with the pretty amazing um, battle paint on, um, convinced Black Hawk and others to try to return. So in 1831, they returned to Sakinuk about 800, 1,000 uh, tribal members, and they were met with by General Gaines, who had a large force at that time, probably around 2,000 uh, soldiers, 
uh, three or four warships and they met, they pleaded with Gaines. Uh, he was obdurate. He, he told them, if you don't, aren't gone within three days, we will remove you. And that was it. They, they stood their ground, but they, they retreated. So, uh, Black Hawk and his band went back across the river. However, that the injustice simmered with them. And the following year, they came back again to Sakinuk, except this time General Gaines was no longer the U.S. leader. It was uh, Henry Atkinson. And they didn't stop to talk to Atkinson. They kept going up the Rock River. And that caused a lot of problems because now they couldn't um, easily uh, make a big show of force against Black Hawk and uh, the British band that Atkinson now was literally having to chase him up the Rock River. So they called up the Illinois militia and started um, going after Black Hawk, Hawk up the river. Um, here are three photos of the, the wonderful museum, the Harburg Museum in Rock Island now, which is you know one of the, the highlights of uh, any of the museums in the Midwest the touch upon the, the SAC and Meskwaki, um, really wonderful collections that have been curated from time to time with members from uh, the SAC and, and Meskwaki tribes, including the, the wigwam you see in the middle and, uh, and Black Hawk's uh, life uh, plaster mask, uh, mask. As um, as Atkinson was trying to figure out just what the motivations of Black Hawk were, he allowed a small contingent of Illinois militiamen. So these were not trained soldiers whatsoever, uh, but uh, and but Atkinson let them go ahead of the main force of the regular um, army, who was having a hard time hauling all of their supplies up their narrow. Rock River. Well, unfortunately, Black Hawk um, realized that his plight was hopeless, that he was not going to be able to um, bring about a resolution, that he wasn't going to receive extra help from the Potawatomi or Winnebago's or the British, that um, he had misstepped and, and gone too far and that he would you know, try to surrender. Unfortunately, uh, the Illinois militia was was just unruly, and when they tried to surrender, uh, they were fired upon. And in retaliation, Black Hawk charged, and he caused a complete rout of Stillman's forces, where about twelve to fifteen of his troops were killed. But it was really in the mad retreat away from Black Hawk's um, forces. But unfortunately, that really um, stoked the spark that then set off the, the rest of the Black Hawk War. And again, I'm not going to be able to go, uh, you know, piece by piece through all of this because I want to um, save time for, for questions at the end and, and share a little bit more on the very local um, um, spots that you may want to check out. Um, but for the, the next two months after the Battle of Stillman's Run, uh, the, the British band and Black Hawk and about eight to 1200, um, of his, of his members, uh, hit out in this area. Um, and it still remains a pretty big question mark. It was north of the Rock River, um, in an area called the Trembling Lands. So before a lot of the agricultural fields were drained, uh, in the late 1800s, it was a marshy quagmire that allowed the British band to be remain elusive from from General Atkinson and American troops, but it also afforded them very little food. So over the months, they really became a haggard and and a, a desperate group. It was around um, quite by accident around July nineteenth when Henry Atkinson's troops uh, near a little north of present day Madison finally ran into a few members of uh, Black Hawk's uh, people. And then the race was really on. 
there was a short battle, the Battle of Wisconsin Heights, where Black Hawk um, had, a, had a notable, um, Jefferson Davis called it one of the most remarkable uh, military maneuvers um, that he had heard of or, or witnessed, where he was able to build uh, very quickly uh, enough rafts and canoes to shuttle his folks across the Wisconsin River um, overnight. So that in the morning when Henry Dodge went to finish the battle, there was no one left to battle. They had all uh, gotten across the river. But unfortunately, it was only uh, a temporary reprieve in that uh, now that they were out of the crumbling lands, the, the marshy area, uh, they were still in, in the hilly terrain from, from north of Madison to the south of La Crosse. But it was uh, it was they didn't give them the 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 sort of um, cover that uh, the former material. Had. By um, early August, uh, the uh, military had caught up with um, the British band on the shore of the Battle of Bad Axe, where the Bad Axe River um, meets the Wisconsin River, about thirty minutes south of La Crosse by today's DeSoto, Wisconsin. Again, um, Black Hawk tried to um, surrender, but unfortunately, um, they were still fired upon. And um, what then took place was probably nothing less of what could be considered a massacre, um, as troops um, were really unwilling or unable to tell the difference between women and child or and fighting. Uh, people. Um, so it was really, really a terrible um, situation. Uh, over the, the course of the summer, Henry Dodge really became one of the noted commanders um, that is General Atkinson stayed around the Whitewater Fort Atkinson area, trying, searching in vain for Black Hawk. Dodge had a couple of small, small battles, um, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend down by a little north of Galena, and really became kind of the spark or the the force to um, really force the the war to a violent conclusion. I was pretty struck to find this uh, this um, in the Galenian too, um, you know, for a, a media a newspaper of the time to be causing for the the final extermination of the. The, the battle was uh, pretty, pretty terrible. Um, these, this is uh, the renderings of the left is, are the general bluffs of, uh, of the area around the Battle of Bad Axe. And on the right is what the, the bluff looks today. And it's owned by the Wisconsin DNR. It is uh, a spot you can visit, but it, it's very hard to reach. It's, uh, um, it might be hard to tell in this picture, but it's a very vertical climb. It's uh, like going up a 45 degree angle and it's close to 300 feet um, high. Uh, really wonderful views of the, the Mississippi River, but you can see kind of the, the, the terrible terrain that the, the battle took place in. Um, here's just a, a couple quotes. Um, they did capture around uh, 150 prisoners or so after the massacre at, at Bad Axe. And, um, you know, the, the U.S. military soldiers really didn't, you know, try to mince their words at all. They were pretty forthright that they ignored the, the white flag of surrender. And, um, you know, they, they, their patience had run out. They, they were going to fight and and be pretty ruthless in their getting their revenge on the sack and the Nisquaki. So so it's a very, very sad story. <laughs> um, and I just encourage you to, you know, uh, again, I think uh, Black Hawk's um, biography is is really a, a great source. And as you can tell from this map that we're re really in the center of so many uh, museums and historical sites and even the battlefields 
that took place that year that it really is a little incumbent upon us to know more about the history and to realize that it, it wasn't just, um, you know, that this land had communities in it. It had, you know, crops, corn fields, uh, you know, the resting places of generations of uh, people's uh, families. And it was a, a thriving, you know, wonderful area that, um, you know, we really owe a debt to. Um, so I, I know that was kind of abrupt, but I wanted to, before I touch base and share a little bit more on a couple sites near us, is there anything in, in that that people want to talk about or, or touch base on? Um, I just sent you a, a chat. Can you see the chat or no? Because I had a question there. Sure. So, um, in so Black Hawk, by the time the the war started, he was in his sixties, and earlier he had been um, a warrior who had was fighting on the side of the British during the War of 1812. So he had led a group of, of uh, Sac and Meskwaki um, up into the Ohio Valley um, with Tecumseh against the British, I mean, with the British, against the Americans. So they had for many decades been uh, partners with the British and re received you know, gifts and um, had been trading partners with the British. So their allegiance with the British for you know decades um, is is really where that where the British band moniker comes from. So when the Americans and the British finally uh, ended the War of 1812, um, the Sac and Fox would still meet pretty regularly with the British um, in Canada. Uh, they would still trade with them. They still preferred meeting with the British. Um, and uh, and that is why um, Black Hawks and his band were called the British Band. Um, so there is always a little hope against hope that maybe uh, another confederacy of tribes like Com Tecumseh had tried in the early 1800s, that maybe the Potawatomi, the Winnebago, um, certainly the Kickaboo um, and the British would come back and help them fight the Americans. But that was never, never really in the cards. Um, so that, that's an interesting uh, a piece of it too. Um, and for the, let's see. Um, and it is interesting that for the first few wars after the, the the war of 1832, it wasn't called um, you know the Black Hawk War at all. I mean, he was definitely one of the most prominent members. His autobiography became very popular when he toured the East Coast. There are huge crowds to see him and his son and a couple other members um, of of his community. But it was really a few years after that is when it became, you know, just connected to him so directly that it was called the, the Black Hawk War. Um, I'm, I'm now going to go through just a couple of, of the most uh, easily accessible for, for folks in the Whitewater area um, to, to, to travel to. Um, and the, the first is a great hike the the bald bluff up by lagrange in wisconsin um it's right off uh county h it's uh it's a great payoff <laughs> i mean you can park there and even after an early steep climb uh have just a, an amazing view and then if you want to go down the path a little bit farther um i think it's around two and a half miles but it's still a pretty easy hike through the woods is a um is the stone elephant which is a glacial erratic probably the size of a vw bug um but is also sort of a local landmark 
um, and just just a really nice site. The other one, which is really not too far, just a little bit north of Madison, but the DNR has done a really great site. Um, it likely looks a lot different today than at the time of the Battle of Wisconsin Heights. Um, it's a lot more forested um, than it, it would have been. It would have been mainly prairie with a, a few stands of oak trees. But it's uh, the nice thing about this is it's really in the times I've been there, I've never seen anyone else there. It's uh, very nice, probably three or four mile circle, a couple different options, and you get a nice view of the Wisconsin River. And it's a, a striking spot just to imagine, um, you know, a thousand people frantically um, trying to build rafts and canoes to escape over the, the Wisconsin River. Um, but that's that's one of the other than the Battle of Bad Axe or the Massacre of Bad Axe, um, the largest um, battle that happened um, during the war. Another interesting one is, is to give you a sense of the, the marshiness, the muckiness, um, what this area was like before the, the land was drained. Um, you know, it's something like 98% of all of Wisconsin's uh, marshland has, you know, been turned uh, um, cropland. So we've lost so much of it. But there is a, a nice area north of Fort Atkinson, the Jefferson Marsh Wildlife Area. Um, the trails are, are very walkable in the summer, definitely a lot of mosquitoes, a lot of ticks, but it really gives you that, that sense of, of what the landscape was likely like. And if you're there during a spring flood, um, it, you know, you can definitely see just how difficult it would have been for a military force to try to navigate that area. It just really is a, a, a perplexing, um, beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, then again, um, I'll mention uh, Fort Atkinson, which is probably the most, the community that most embraces uh, the Black Hawk War and its icono iconography and, and history. And there's been notable folks from Fort Atkinson, who've done a lot to um, uh, conserve their heritage, conserve the effigy mounds in their area, as as well to um, really celebrate and um, and make noticeable the life of Black Hawk and and the Black Hawk War. You may have missed uh, downtown. There's a, a fantastic mural by Michael Mayoski which is a little bit hidden, but it's on the top of the Black Hawk um, Senior Center. They also have a, a recreation of, of Fort Atkinson, um, which is not in the right place. Nobody knows exactly where Fort Atkinson was, um, even though the town is named Fort Atkinson. Um, it's been uh, amateur archaeologists and faculty members here and there have, have tried to find the official spot, but um, that still remains a little lost. But a lot of these forts were very temporary, that they were just used for that summer for a couple of months. Um, and by the time settlers and people who are coming for good um, want, were in the area to, to found their cities, um, you know, the, the use of a, a fort like that was, was really immaterial. The danger had been long over and they sometimes would use the timber for firewood or for building other things, but they didn't save most of, most of the forts. Um, I'll also mention the Hedberg, um, uh, or the, the, the museum in Fort Atkinson is also wonderful, the Horde Museum. They have a wonderful display, a reading room on Abraham Lincoln and the Black Hawk War, which has many, you know, very nice um, pieces, as well as a room dedicated to the history of the effigy mounds in the area. So that's very uh, having a, a nice free spot to to travel to and, and to visit. Another one is uh, Storrs Lake in Milton, just a little bit outside of Whitewater. 
Now, the Milton House was built about 10 years after the war, but it was built on the crossroads of two major Native American trails. And if you go down um, Stores Lake Road a little bit to Stores Lake, uh, you'll be at one of the sites where Abraham Lincoln uh, camped during that summer and was actually one of the spots of the largest massing of the military, um, close to 4,000 people, which is, is really amazing considering it would have been bigger than St. Louis at the time. Uh, Chicago had maybe 200 people in it. Um, so it was really an amazing mass of people um, in what was then a, a pretty, um, you know, pretty unknown uh, area to to most Americans. The uh, the the interesting thing is, um, I mean, it just it was really interesting to me, and a lot of people have, um, you know, just been enamored with Lincoln for for so many reasons. But with his time in the Black Hawk War, how he just never really brings it up again. <laughs> that uh, in 1832, about two years before he, um, before he joins the militia, he writes a letter to the Sagamon uh, Journal, the, the, his local newspaper, which came out once a week. And he had a, a long editorial announcing how he's going to be running for um, for the Illinois State Assembly. Um, and he he signs up for the Black Hawk War, traipses all around Illinois and a little bit into Wisconsin. And and it's striking that, you know, today we're so used to when politicians, um, you know, talk about their bona fides for running for office. If they were in the military, they would talk about it all the time. They would wear it on their sleeve, um, which is, you know, absolutely notable. I mean, people who serve the military should, you know, receive that honor. But um, but there's just so few references of uh, Black Hawk, I mean, of, of, of Lincoln in the Black Hawk War. And what's even more striking is he um, campaigned for Zachary Taylor, who was in the Black Hawk War, who was the commander at Fort Croft and Prairie du Chien. And when Zachary Taylor dies uh, in office, Lincoln is asked to go to Chicago and memorialize him at the service. And during that, Lincoln again does not bring up that he was in the same uh, conflict as uh, Zachary Taylor. Um, so it, it was, you know, always very interesting. And along, you know, Northern Illinois, uh, there's there's Lincoln, young, young Lincoln sites all over the place, and you can't turn around without hitting one. Um, and I wanted to note, oh, I must, I missed that slide. Uh, part of the reason why Lincoln uh, may not have talked too much about the Black Hawk War, is in 1850, a book by Benjamin Drake came out, which was the first real history of the Black Hawk conflict. And we know that Lincoln had that book in his library. So by the 1850s, when Lincoln is now a, a lawyer in Springfield, the public's uh, perception of the war and the fairness of it really had changed. So uh, Drake's history really eviscerated uh, American military and the, uh, the policies of Indian removal. Um, so we know that, that Lincoln had that book, that he more than likely read it. And he then really never brings up, except for one or two you know, very small references his time in the Black Hawk War, even when um, you may have heard that there's the, the Tallman Lincoln House in Janesville, a home where Lincoln stayed overnight for two nights while he was campaigning in the 1850s. In those speeches, as Lincoln's now come back to Wisconsin, uh, the state, the great state of Wisconsin, now no longer the Northwest Territory, um, Lincoln doesn't mention, oh, I was you know, here 20 years ago fighting, you know, Black Hawk and, and a militia man. 
he just, you know, skirts right over the, the issue. So I just found that, you know, you know, very interesting too. So again, I wanted to just wrap it up and, and note those couple of references. And if people have any questions, I'm happy to hang around. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. Really fascinating um, history. And I did see a couple things in the chat. Let's see if I can pull that up again. Um, Bill um, Green, are, are you still here, Bill? Do you want to um, read this out loud or do you want me to read it for you? Are you where are you, Bill? Um, I guess maybe there's a problem with the sound. So. Um, Bill says, um, there is a Black Hawk War state historic marker um, in, in Beloit that mentions Ho-Chunk Village called K-Chunk. That was at the mouth of Turtle Creek. And um, this was deserted when the militia went through the area, but it had been the largest Ho-Chunk Village in the Rock River Valley. No physical remnants have yet been found, but nearby Nature at the Confluence has public art installation by Truman Lowe. It represents a ho chunk dwelling. I've been at that mm -hmm. confluence. It's amazing. And the history there, I've heard um, people talk about the ho chunk as well. Mm -hmm. I thought there were some, um, like the ho chunk, he, Black Hawk wanted them to help or something, or were, I forget what was that, you know, in a nutshell. <laughs> sure, sure. Yep, so the, the Ho-Chunk um, were actually, the, so the Indian agent for the Ho-Chunk was uh, John Kinsey. So while this was, while the war was going on, Kinsey was up near Portage building his Indian agency house. And Indian agents were an interesting sort of quasi-governmental figure who were there to keep the peace to, you know, set treaties, to often work between intertribal relations to try to keep um, intertribal warfare to a minimum. So Kinsey, as, a, as well as Henry Dodge and Atkinson, were all hoping to keep the Winnebago out of the war, as well as the Potawatomi. Um, so they diligently worked to um, try to minimize their involvement at all because they did not want a, a full-fledged um you know war between numerous uh, native american groups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is that is of course makes sense from their perspective right <laughs> oh right. and and something about naming i think this is good because we, we mentioned the ho-chunk which are, are now the ho-chunk in some places but they go in other places still um, yep. But also, I see that Lexi point, pointed out the difference maybe between calling um, battles re being renamed as massacres. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on whether this was, was there an effort to do that? Yeah, well, um, well, that that's pretty interesting. I think if anyone reads, and I put in, in the book two longer uh, descriptions of the battle by, you know, uh, American soldiers who were there, you know, I think people pretty quickly would see that it's much more of a massacre, <laughs> that pretty indiscriminate, um, you know, you know, having women and children and civilians in the thick of, of the fighting. Uh, and, and why, you know, this specific action never you know, receive the sort of um, attention that, you know, you know, you think of the the Dakota and Lakota wars. Um, are you know people just seem to know those more than this one? I don't know why. Um, so you're right. People have called it a battle, but I think in the last decades, if not um, longer, it's pretty much a massacre. Um, I'll also note that um, in the 80s, the Wisconsin legislature did uh, formally apologize to the SAC and Meskwaki. They mm. had a ceremony with about 200 people came. They had invited uh, the tribal leaders um, to come as well. I don't think any of them made it. 
but they officially officially had a proclamation that is really in depth and notes that uh, you know Blackhawk was trying to lead his people uh, in peace back to their homelands, and uh, they note that it was a, a massacre. So it's it was pretty striking, and you know it, when I when that proclamation was made, I was still in you know elementary school, um, but it never you know and I lived in the area, <laughs> but it never really is you know a conscious community uh reckoning so mm. oh, that's fascinating wow anybody else have some some questions i think this is so interesting hey, ben the information is really fascinating and um i ordered your book so i'm looking forward to reading it thank but, you uh, you know how long did this take to put together you know this how much this Seems like an extraordinary effort and combing through the weeds to pull some of this stuff together. So how how, do, how challenging was it? How long did it take? Yeah, well, it's uh, thanks, Frank. Basically, um, it uh, so I didn't start out, you know, to, uh, that my grading a book wasn't a goal. It was really after um, it. So probably twelve years from start to finish. And it was probably probably halfway in when I knew that, you know, the state of Wisconsin and Illinois had at times made a list of all the the sites, but you know they didn't include the museums and and for me it was really for people to know where the First Nations were today, um, and you know some of the museums you know really didn't talk about that at all. And uh, and it was really when I reached out to each of the, you know, each of the First Nations has a historic, you know, uh, museum. When I started talking with the people at those uh, facilities, um, and and then you know, kind of sharing my story that I grew up in a town named after this, you know, slave owner, <laughs> the first governor of Wisconsin, and. When I bring it up to people, no one knows about it. Um, so that's when it really started moving, and I start started talking to a couple, you know, historic presses, and they helped me, you know, formulate it more, and and it changed a lot. And then probably three years ago is when I had the contract and and had a year to get it done, and now for the last you know year it's sat in limbo because of the COVID thing. So. Mm. Right. Wow. Quite an undertaking. Yeah. Anybody else have a, a comment? Yeah, or... I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering, just like while you were talking, I also just ordered your book, which looks great. And no, I'm excited to explore excellent. this summer and go around. Um, yeah, it looks great. And I really like everything was so interesting to see so much you don't know, even though you do live around here. I'm just wondering if you like throughout the writing process, because you've been working on this so long, if you if there were like current social justice issues that popped in your mind that you could connect it to. It just seems like there's themes of, you know, untrained military militia people overstepping their bounds and not being trained and that. So, yeah, are there like themes or current social justice issues that came to your mind as you were writing and putting this together? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, all over, you know, everywhere. Um, the a couple of the biggest ones was in the the media that here in Galena, uh, which was kind of the center of the lead mining region, were these two newspapers, the the Galenian and the Miners Journal, and the Miners Journal was kind of the hard scrabble you know, where do you get your dungarees and, you know, and then the Galenian, they're the ones who, and I, I put it in this little presentation, their editor really stoked the fire, you know, um, to see in 1832, you know, runaway slave notices, to see, you know, that we need a final extermination of this Indian problem. I mean, mm -hmm. This is, I mean, I just, it's chilling. It's terrible. And the role that media can play for good or bad. Um, and then there, the, the editor for the, and I put it a little more in the book, 
the editor of the Galenian actually signed on and took part in the Battle of uh, the Bad Axe and Wisconsin Heights and really was kind of glorifying in, in what they were doing. Um, and he was a doctor too. So really, so from so many ways that just that they're, so I think Wisconsin is doing a lot better. But even now, you know, the Sock and the Meskwaki, you know, they're not here anymore. And the Kickapoo, that we don't always recognize those that were forced out. Um, so, yeah, on many, many levels, I hope this just, you know, keeps those discussions going. And, yeah, the, the threads and the, you know, the, the, the social justice pieces and, and if you ever want to talk more, there's a, there was also a cholera epidemic, which is really central, which again is a very long conversation. Wow. Well, that point about about the uh, epidemics spreading through um, mm -hmm. is I'm glad you brought that one up too, because the when I teach about this by students, you know, there were there were wars, there were battles, there were plenty of um, you know violent incidents, but 90% of the native people died from germs, right? From, yep, yep. from epidemics. So, and some of which were not just um, random, right? So yeah. the conversation for sure could go on and on. I think it's such a fascinating start. And I look forward to, to taking some of those, those tours once we can get back outside and then really explore. Any, any last thoughts or questions for Ben? Um, I just want to say thank you so much for presenting the information that you have here today. And I will definitely be looking at your book. That sounds so exciting. But um, I just wanted to talk about like that powwow that you mentioned in the, mid the beginning of the presentation, which sounds really fun. Um, haven't been to a powwow in a while. It's been too long. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, but thank you so much for um, presenting today. Sure. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated for sure. And I will, I will just say, um, we have recorded this for anybody um, who knows you know, someone who wasn't able to make it. And I will also um, ask Ben if we can maybe get the, the PowerPoint um, sure, I'd sure. Love to, to use a few of the slides for classes. And I want to introduce, I mean, uh, announce that next week we're going to have another NACA meeting, of course, with uh, current, current events sort of following on Lexi's comment. So what kinds of current events are going on in Indian country mm. in the news? And so bring things that you might might know and we can have a, a conversation. So. All right, I will stop the recording and. Thank you again. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.